So welcome to Introduction to Business. We're going to go over Chapter 1. So some of the learning outcomes. The learning outcomes. How do business, how do businesses and not-for-profit organizations help create our standard of living? What are the sectors of the business environment and how do changes in them influence business decisions? What are the primary features of the world's economic systems and how are they, how are the three sectors of the US and economy linked together? How do economic growth, full employment, price stability and inflation indicate a nation's economic health? How do the government use monetary and fiscal policy to achieve its macroeconomic goals? What are the basic microeconomic concepts of demand and supply and how do they establish prices? What are the four types of market structure and which trends are reshaping the business, microeconomic and macroeconomic environments and competitive arena? So one of the things that you could watch is why do we serve the year in service? This video will help you understand what nonprofit organizations offer in terms of opportunities in their careers and service. Let's hit the play button. Why do we serve? What makes us work so hard? To sleep on the ground. Get banged up and bruised, sweat soaked and sore. Let me ask you, how could we not? Omaha, Great Abaco, Houston, Sublet, Wyoming, Talkeetna, Alaska, Dondo, and Bira. These are not just places on the map for us. When disaster strikes, it strikes us our neighbors, our communities. This is where we live. This is where we work. This is where we serve. been there with grit and determination, knowing that whatever obstacle, whatever challenge, whatever Mother Nature throws at us, that together we can overcome. Why do we serve? Because together we can restore hope. Why do we serve? Because it's what we're built for. So after this video, on why do we serve? What was the messaging behind this nonprofit organization? What message was it trying to get convey? Think about it. Think about when they're branding themselves and offering their type of service. Think about the what, the why, and purpose of their business.
So here are some questions that you might need to think about and reflect. Team Rubicon. If as stated in the introduction, many new businesses do not survive even their first anniversary, what might account for a not-for-profit like Team Rubicon staying in business for 10 years as of 2020? Think about what type of branding they are offering. What differentiates them from other nonprofit businesses? What are some of the reasons that might motivate these people who decide to volunteer at Team Rubicon? So people volunteer because they're motivated and believe in the messaging, such as the mission and values of an organization, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a for-profit organization, when consumers, customers, people believe in the brand and believe in the vision and mission statement of the company, they will purchase it. They will volunteer for it. Think about what type of branding businesses that you are loyal to and why are you loyal to that particular business? Question three, are you passionate about a cause or issue that affects your local community or even the planet at large? If you are not yet involved with an organization dedicated to this is issue, maybe research and find such a group to find a way how you can help. So you also have to think about as an individual, what motivates you to volunteer and why do you volunteer? Everyone volunteers or supports a cause because they believe in that cause. They support the cause because they want to better the society in whatever cause they're looking for, whether it's um, fighting against global warming, um, fighting against fracking, environmental issues. What moves you to volunteer? And what is your, uh, your purpose of volunteering? Think about that when you're looking through this Team Rubicon. So here are some concept checks that you might want to consider. Um, explain the concept of revenue, cost, and profit. All right. What are the five factors of production and what role does an entrepreneur play in society? So some of the four factors of production. What does it take? Here's a video that relates to the Ford production, and it talks about the co-founder Bill Gates and Google founder Sergey Brin and Larry Page. If economics is all about how people use their scarce resources to try to satisfy their unlimited wants, then it might be a good idea for us to think about what the term resources actually means. When economists talk about resources, they mean productive resources. The resources actually have to be able to produce something, a product or a service. So what kinds of stuff do we use to produce goods and services? We use people, fuel and energy. We use machines, factories, plants, animals. Okay. Clearly, a lot of things are used in the production of goods and services. Economists like to simplify things to make the story more intuitive. So what do you say we put all of the resources into just a few broad categories? Land is any natural resource. Sure, this includes land land, like farmland or real estate, but it also includes trees, plants, livestock, wind, sun, water, oil. You get the idea. The category labor refers to any human service, physical or intellectual. You're adding to the package of labor services that you have to offer right now by learning. Some labor comes naturally, an athletic gift perhaps that allows you to play professional ball to earn a living, but you can certainly add to your package of labor services, sometimes referred to as human capital, through job training, experience, conferences, workshops, or education. The category of capital. Now before I go one step further, let me say this. Money is not a resource. Remember what I said about resources? They need to be productive. They have to be used to make something else and money can't do that. Don't get me wrong. Money helps the economy move along more efficiently, more smoothly. It's like grease for the economic machine. 
but in and of itself, it can't produce anything. It's used to acquire the productive resources that can produce goods and services. There's confusion that's understandable since most media refers to financial capital or investment capital, so it does refer to money. But what is economic capital? By definition, economic capital is anything that's manufactured in order to be used in the production of goods and services. Well, more simply, capital's machinery and equipment. This includes factory machinery, but also the factory itself in computers, furnishings, books, roads, phone lines, etc. The last major resource category is entrepreneurial ability. What, or rather, who is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is someone who, first of all, is able to recognize a profit opportunity. Second, is able to organize the other factors of production, another phrase for resources. And third, is willing to accept risk. Look, do you know who Joe Johnston is? In the late 1980s, he and his partner left their engineering jobs and opened up a coffee shop in downtown Tempe. Now what you have to realize is that at that time the downtown area was, well, shall we say, a little less than desirable. It was just prior to the revitalization and renovation of that area. And believe it or not, no one had ever heard of a little place called Starbucks, so quite frankly, I'm sure that people thought these two guys were nuts. Bad location, bad product, who ever heard of making a living selling coffee in the desert? Bad idea. Well, Joe and his partner took a chance, opened that first coffee plantation, and it was a hit. Within a few years, they sold it off for millions. These two guys saw a profit opportunity. There's 50,000 plus caffeine starved students less than two miles away. Come on. They took the risk and organized the resources to start that business and make it successful. After selling the coffee plantation, Joe went on to other ventures Joe's Barbecue, Joe's Farm Grill, and most recently, Liberty Market. That's entrepreneurial ability, folks. Next time, micro versus macro. So class, think about what your thoughts are on this video about the four factors of production. And let's focus on the entrepreneurial spirit. What is an entrepreneur? What makes you an entrepreneur, right? Think about it. One of the things about an entrepreneur does, it, it creates jobs. Also, the entrepreneur has a passion for what they do, generally speaking. They meet a need for the consumer and address that need. What do you think that you want to do in your business? What's your passion? What, what change would it do for society? What change would it do for your business? Is it all about money and profit or is it something that you're passionate about? Something to think. So here's something about a knowledge check. And this question, you don't have to answer it in a Canvas message per se, but just think about on your own when you're thinking about your business plan. So here's some concept checks to look for when you're thinking about the next chapter. So here is a good infograph about the external environment to that affects the business and what are some of the internal environments. The external environments are these outside outer lines such as the economic, political, demographic, social, competitive, global and technological impact on your business. These are outside factors that could affect your business, right? For example, Technological advancement and social attitude changes. Do you remember Blockbuster video? Do you remember Hollywood video? Why did they go out of business? There was a lot of technological invas advancement, uh, starting to have internet and streaming services and Blockbuster and Hollywood video did not want to adapt. DVDs and VHS, that's what they were relying on the consumer to come in and check out these DVDs and some even check out VHS to watch the films. But now Netflix, it started out as a CD rental, DVD rental, and now it's a streaming service on the internet. And it's a huge market. There's a lot of other streaming services out there that you could think of, Disney Plus, 
um, HBO Max, even YouTube TV. Because of technological investment and the social behavior of how consumers take in films, TV series, through the streaming services app. And our mobile technology has certainly advanced that way. What are some of the demographic shifts and changes? The younger generation, the gen generation Y, the millennials, the Gen Zers, they grew up on technology and social media and YouTube and the way of viewing television and streaming service through the hand device of their mobile phones. Right. Some of the inter environment is the inner workings of the business, such as the owner, the manager, and the workers within that business and how it operates, and the, custom, the customers that frequent that business. Those are the internal matters that must be handled. But remember this flow chart. External environment is the outer ring right here. The internal environment is the inner circle, the inner workings of your business that relates to your employees, your managers, your coworkers and customers that frequent that business. Here's a video from Khan Economy that uh, might give you some visual insight to this concept. Hey everyone, this is Matt from Alan East Business Academy. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the external business environment. And this topic, I actually gave a lecture on a few days ago in my intro to business class and thought I'd take the opportunity to update some of the resources that we have related to this topic. We do have a few videos available on the external business environment. Uh, they were done several years ago and frankly with some older technology that we had at the time. So I thought I'd take this time to update that and give us a, a brand new video and that sort of thing. So hopefully you find the information valuable, of course. Uh, so let's start by going into what is the external business environment. Uh, frankly, the external business environment is anything outside of the control of a business of some kind that has the potential to affect it in some way. So we operate under the assumption that as individuals, but also as businesses, we can control very little. There's a lot that happens outside of our control. So the mindset then shifts to, well, if I can't necessarily control these things, the best that I can do is try to pay attention and predict them. And if I can potentially predict them, then adapt to them, obviously, before they become an issue to where they're negatively affecting my business. And that really is the goal, is to try to make some changes so that we're not necessarily caught flat-footed and we can make those adjustments so whether it be a change in, in price or whether it's a competitor that's doing th something that could potentially affect our business, if we have some type of idea that potentially can happen, then we can take some actions necessary to try to lessen the impact of it. That's really the goal here is not trying to change or prevent these trends from happening. But if we can at least anticipate them, trying to adapt to them beforehand, and if there are opportunities, then obviously trying to leverage those as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that once we get a little further along here in the video. So the first thing that we need to do is talk about the different environments, almost like sub-environments within the external business environment. And obviously, we're talking about anything outside of the control of the business, but that's pretty vague in general. And so it becomes very difficult to try and analyze everything that could potentially affect your business. And so what we've done is we separate these into six environments just for the purpose of doing research so that we can make sure and consider some really important things here. Uh, the first of those, and this is really in no apparent order, I'll go ahead and list them first and then we'll talk about them a little bit, uh, is the economic environment. We have the social environment, the technological environment, the competitive environment, the political and legal environment, and lastly, the global environment. So these are six environments altogether, each of which has the potential to affect the business in some way. So let's go through and talk about each of these. Uh, I'll give you a kind of a, a quick definition, at least in terms of the way that I would describe it. And then I'll give you an example of maybe a change or a trend that could be important to some businesses. Maybe not all businesses, because remember, we're talking about a business's unique uh, external business environment. So 
although there might be some factors like the economy that affects all businesses in a pretty similar way, it still doesn't affect them in an identical fashion, if that makes any sense. So let's first talk about the economic environment. When I say economic environment, what I'm referring to is the condition of the economy where the business primarily operates. So wherever the business primarily derives its revenues, we're talking about the condition of that economy. So if we have a business that operates primarily in the United States, and that's where a bulk of its revenues are derived from, then the United States economy would be its economic environment. And so what we're really concerned about here is the the health and the condition of that economy. So really, the key question is how are consumers doing in the economy? We want to know what are their habits, what are their purchasing habits, but but also what are things like unemployment, uh, what is GDP, you know, we're looking at economic metrics to get a sense for the health of the consumer. Because as you know, the majority of the growth in the economy is derived from consumer spending. So if consumers aren't spending money, then that will affect the health of the economy. If consumers' wages have been declining or inflation is continuing to rise, that could potentially affect consumer purchasing power. It affects the amount of money that they actually have in their possession, which will mean that they're less likely to purchase certain goods and services, right? Kind of stick to necessities. And we saw this happen in the latest recession in 2008, 2009, where people really did start to buckle down on saving, try to eliminate debt, uh, because they were just concerned and fearful for what the future was going to hold. And so those are things that as a business, you would want to pay attention to, especially if your consumer is suffering rather significantly. Even in recessions, even during difficult economic times, not everyone suffers the same way. So you need to understand what your consumer is and how they're doing financially. But unfortunately, if you're not paying attention to what is going on in the economic environment, then you might be creating products that consumers don't have a need for at that point in time. Maybe they're outside of the uh, price range that consumers can afford at that point in time. So those are important things to consider in that particular area. Now, the next environment is the social environment. The social environment includes changes in demographics, in consumer preferences, interests, and even lifestyles within a particular society. And so like all things, from a business perspective, we're looking for potential changes or trends that might lead to some type of advantage if I could potentially leverage. So a couple of things to consider here in this area. Uh, the first thing is, is there's been a significant trend towards trying to have a healthier lifestyle. And this overall is a good trend, right? From a societal standpoint, we generally want people who are healthier because that affects ultimately healthcare costs and those types of things. And, you know, it's better to have a healthier society versus the opposite. So that's, that's certainly a good thing. Uh, and we've seen opportunities as a result of that. So as people desire to eat healthier, we've seen businesses adapt to that to try to leverage that particular opportunity. So this includes everything from portion control, where we've seen a lot of businesses that are now lessening the amount of food that they include, whether that's prepackaged, whether that's on a restaurant menu. We've seen those kind of light options, if you will. And those are a direct result of trying to cater to a group of consumers that wants healthier options. You know, we've seen even companies like McDonald's who have historically been known for obviously being kind of the, the opposite of, of a healthy lifestyle, even start to adapt their offerings in an attempt to cater towards a different consumer. Now, regardless if that's effective or not from a McDonald's standpoint, you know, you certainly can't argue that they're trying to cater towards this healthier lifestyle. So those are things that you would look for. In changing demographics, uh, one that is particularly uh, kind of significant now, at least in the U.S., is obviously the the – uh, baby boomers who are continuing to age and getting close to retirement. Uh, that is a significant opportunity as well. And as we've talked about before, that creates opportunities for different services related to retirement homes and other things that are in necessity as people get older, especially when you have 
such a large number of people that are getting older in a very similar time frame as well. Now, the next thing is the technological environment. And the technological environment involves changes in technology that can potentially add value to consumers. So from a business perspective, what I'm looking at here is if there is a change in technology that will allow me to provide a product or service that can help people essentially. I mean, that's really at its core, a function of a business is to provide value. And if they're not providing value, then ultimately that's going to affect the success of the business. So let me give you a couple of examples to talk about some changes with regards to technology and how that's affected the environment and how we've seen. Uh, so one of those changes first that I'll mention is with regards to digital books. And this is a not such a recent trend so much as what the mid 2000s, but you know, some companies were able to leverage this change rather successfully while others weren't necessarily. And so the companies I'll name are one being Amazon and the other being Borders. Now, Amazon, as we know, started off selling physical books solely and has since branched out into pretty much every possible item that you could purchase, uh, but was originally a big pioneer behind this digital books technology. They came out with the Kindle in the mid-2000s and were really one of the early adopters, even when a lot of businesses didn't think that digital books would really be that big of a deal. I mean, why would you want a physical book in your possession or why would you want a digital book rather? Why wouldn't you want a physical book uh, that you can open? It has a physical form. You own it and, and those sorts of things. And that really affected the extent to which they adopted that particular technology. It wasn't very uh, – it was rather late until they developed their own dedicated e-reader and and by that time, you know, Amazon had already had a dominant foothold. So those are some changes that Amazon saw and that could potentially be an opportunity as a way of providing – uh, content to people in a way that's rather convenient, right? You don't have to lug books around. You can carry quite a few in an e-reader or an iPad or some other tablet. And so it provides a great deal of value. The other thing that I'll mention is with regards to uh, to travel and to car services. Uh, Uber is a relatively newer company. I think they were established in 2010 or 11, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, personally, I really enjoy the service. I've used it a couple of times, uh, well, more than a few. Uh, when I travel, I typically use it, and it's uh, very convenient. Uh, if you're not familiar with the service, really how it works, and just so you know, kind of disclaimer, I don't work for them or anything like that. I'm merely a very, very happy customer. Uh, how the service works, just so you know, is you basically sign online, create an account, store your credit card information within an app, and then you actually use an app to call a car to your current location. And if you're kind of concerned that sounds a little bit creepy, you know, a photo of the driver shows up, information on the car they're driving shows up, so you know exactly who to expect to come pick you up. It's not just some random person, obviously. And that person shows up, uh, they ask for your destination, they take you there, and the payment is all handled behind the scenes. And so if you really don't like fumbling with you know, making sure you have the right bills to go in a taxi, trying to hail a taxi cab for, for the most part, which is rather difficult depending upon where you are, uh, and standing outside forever, uh, it really is a rather convenient solution that one, leverages technology in the form of mobile technology, so we're kind of obviously getting in that area. Uh, but really enhances and provides value because it's just so much more convenient now and the experience of getting a car and traveling from point A to point B is relatively easy, uh, especially considering if you've had a lot of experience in taxi cabs and fumbling with payments and figuring all that stuff out. So those would be some examples of changes in terms of technology and how businesses have used them to really provide value to customers, which is really important. So once again, Going back to, well, from a business perspective, what do we do? Our goal is to try to anticipate these changes and then leverage them to provide value. Another environment here within the external business environment is the competitive environment. Now, the competitive environment covers actions or competitor actions that pose a potential threat to another company. So one of the big things, obviously, for many companies is to be aware of what its competition is doing uh, because a number of different things, uh, one of which is that if they create a product or a service that could potentially have an inf have an effect on your sales or you know anything related to that, then that could be very, very difficult to sustain long term. 
And so we've seen a lot of competition within the the last several years. You know, we've seen Apple and Samsung kind of go Samsung rather go head to head uh, with regards to patents in pretty much every geographic area. Uh, we've seen a number of different companies, uh, particularly Uber and Lyft, which is a, a similar car service as well, not as big in terms of revenues and financial support, but provides a very similar service. Also, in this particular environment where you have them offering almost identical services and coming out with those services at very, very similar times, in large part, that's because of this competitive environment, because they know if one of them is going to offer that service, it would really put them at a disadvantage if they weren't, especially considering it's a relatively new market. So there's no telling which is going to be the most successful. And the last thing that you would want is to avoid adopting something and then find out that that was really what consumers wanted. And that's now kind of the flagship product or service for that other company. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are happening here. You know, you go into kind of e-commerce and you start talking about Amazon and Walmart. And obviously Amazon is the dominant player in e-commerce. There's there's should be no surprise when I say that. But then looking at some of the things that Walmart is trying to doing to better compete, you have some of the brick and mortar locations that are trying to leverage their physical stores for distribution. Uh, and so those are some things that are happening in the competitive environment. And so the key is to be aware of what your competition is doing, which could be difficult because we try to maintain some secret practices, obviously. You don't want to disclose everything. But being aware of what your competition is doing so that you can make an assessment if ultimately it matters. If you need to do anything about it, maybe not. But if you do, what does that look like? Is it offering a similar product or service or merely positioning, repositioning something you already have? Unfortunately, you really can't make that change unless you're familiar with what's actually happening in the competitive environment. The next environment is the political and legal environment. And this includes any changes or trends with regards to legislation, regulations, and even court decisions that have the potential to affect a business in some way. Now, we know that the government does a whole lot. Uh, some of that is maybe good for business. A lot of it is not necessarily. And so we have to be aware of what are those potential things that are happening that pose a risk to us so that we can adapt accordingly. Obviously, it's really difficult to affect government policy unless you are a well-established company with a lot of money to throw at lobbyists. But most companies don't have that same ability to do so. And so although we can take issues directly to consumers and hope that they kind of address grievances and those types of things and swaying legislation that way, it's not always a guarantee. And so many times we merely have to adapt to what is already happening. So one change or potential change that had a little bit of steam early on and, and seemed to kind of lose a little bit of momentum is the national minimum wage rate. And, you know, a few years ago, this was a very, very big issue. President Obama kind of ran on this platform when he was up for reelection on raising the national minimum wage, regardless of your opinion on whether or not it would really provide any benefit long term. There's two camps, of course. But regardless of that, you can argue that it wouldn't have some type of impact on businesses that particularly hire low wage workers, right? You deal with the increase immediately in your direct labor costs, which of course, you know, potentially you pass along to consumers and everything like that. But that would be a potential change that could pose a risk to your business that you would have to be aware of so that you could adapt accordingly. And the last environment is the global environment. Now here we're focusing on a few different things, but mostly obviously international and dealing with international economic conditions, natural disasters, and even political unrest in a society that spills over and affects your business. You know, we live in a global economy, and so it isn't enough to merely consider what is happening domestically, but businesses also need to consider what is happening around the world, right? Everything from you know, how a, a crisis in the Middle East affects the price of oil has the potential to impact, impact businesses in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that just happened recently within the last few days of this recording is the uh, kind of conflict with the Ukraine and Russia. And you potentially, allegedly, you know, Russia was sending in uh, equipment and, and troops into the Ukraine. 
the Ukraine apparently fired upon them and, and caused some damage and those sorts of things. And if you were watching the stock market or the financial markets, those were very much so affected by that particular crisis. And so something that's happening all the way around the world for some people has the potential to affect what's happening back in the U.S. and in other parts of the world as well. One big th one big event that happened two years ago was the the earthquake and subsequent tsunami over in Japan that caused damage to that nuclear reactor plant. I think it's the Fukushima Fukushima Daiichi power plant, if I'm saying that correctly, hopefully, and that caused some really significant issues with suppliers. So I know, for example. In certain parts in the U.S., it was really difficult to get parts for Japanese-made automobiles because there were certain parts that were manufactured in Japan in that area that was affected and had a big impact on dealerships and body shops being able to get parts to actually repair vehicles here in the U.S. Once again, something that happens all the way across the world but has a potential to impact people in the US and in other areas of the world as well. So from a business standpoint, you know, what you need to consider is the probability of something like that happening, but also attempting to insulate yourself against those potential threats. So, you know, maybe you can't predict when an earthquake is going to happen, but based upon precedent, know that it is a possibility. So what can you do to lessen the impact of such an event happening. So maybe that's diversifying suppliers where, you know, you have things spread out between multiple suppliers in different areas so that if one is negatively affected, you still have operations and can pull supplies from another one, you know, could be a number of different things, but obviously you'd have to start looking at that issue to go ahead and adapt accordingly. So altogether, these six environments represent what we call the external business environment. So each of them has some potential impact on businesses, and it's up to us to go ahead and analyze them so that if we can identify some maybe opportunities for new products or services that we hadn't ordinarily thought of, or potentially identify threats that we have to respond to if we're going to maintain market share and all those other sorts of things. All right, that does it for this video on the external business environment. Hopefully you found that information to be helpful. If you want more information, feel free to go to alanisbusinessacademy.com. Also make sure that you sign up for our email list where we send out periodic updates related to new lessons, podcasts, courses, other really important information that you might find useful. You can do that by going to alanisbusinessacademy.com slash list and feel free to check out some of our other podcasts and lessons that we have on the website as well. Thanks for watching. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay, so this is a YouTube video. If you click uh, the share area, you could copy this link. And once you copy that link, you could direct to the YouTube video. So here's some questions to consider. What would you think that if any of the seven key factors might be more important to consider than others, depending upon the scope and nature of the disaster or event? And concept checked. We're going to talk about economics. We're going to talk about the different economic systems, such as capitalism, communism, and socialism. And what is the difference between the macro versus micro? Think of macroeconomics as a bigger picture. And then the microeconomics is kind of like a specific topic within that big picture, okay? So here are some of the charts of the basic economic systems comparing to capitalism, communism, socialism, mixed economy. And it goes by owners of the business, control of the markets and worker incentives. If you look at mixed economy, and read, read the information related to that, I think a lot of countries, including the US, is not purely based on pure capitalism, where Adam Smith said, hands off approach, the invisible hand of the government, right? Um, that's not necessarily the case. Have we seen throughout business history, when the 2008 market crashed, we realized that the government did bail out the auto industry and bail out some of the industries and had a lot of loans forgiven. You should also think about how 
many businesses got the PPE loans during COVID-19, and many of those loans were forgiven for the big businesses, right? So in a way, there is governmental controls, but at the same time, the entrepreneurial spirit, but it's not purely a hands-off approach to capitalism, right? China is another good example of a mixed economy where uh, you know, communism and capitalism is kind of combined, where the state does control the economy, but does drive in terms of uh, capitalistic ideology, in terms of having to uh, run a business and make a profit, right? Take a look at this chart. It's also in your textbook. And it's a continued system of management of enterprises, compare that with capitalism, communism, socialism, and mixed economy. And a forecast of 2020, right? It'd be interesting to see what the forecast is 2022 and beyond. And here's a circular flow chart related to economics and how these arrows intertwine between inputs and outputs and the resource market versus the product markets. Here's an interesting video explaining about the free mixed and planned economies. Take a look at this. Also within the PowerPoints, if you click on these hyperlinks, you can it takes you directly to the area that you want to look at, such as section 1.2, the economic systems and free mix plan. And there's also a YouTube video where you just copy the video URL and you could see it within your own uh, channel. Here we go. Going back to the basic definition of economics back in episode two, Economics is a study of how people choose to use their scarce resources in an attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants. It might help to think about some specific product or resource, any product or resource that is scarce. Scarcity was also defined back in episode number two, if there's not enough of a commodity available to satisfy all of the wants at a zero price, then that commodity is considered to be scarce. Suppose that sock monkeys, for example, are available free of charge. At a price of zero dollars, assuming we don't have any serious sock monkey phobes, everybody wants a sock monkey. But at a price of zero dollars, there just aren't enough sock monkeys to go around. While lots of people want a sock monkey, there just isn't a whole lot of incentive to produce them. The question then becomes, who gets one of the relatively scarce sock monkeys? That is, by what means will these monkeys be allocated? Different societies have tried different methods of allocation, that is to say they have adopted different economic systems to determine what products are produced, how they get produced, and who gets the scarce commodities once they've been produced. Going back to our example, one way to allocate the monkeys would be to start charging a price above zero dollars for them. The higher price motivates sellers to produce more and drives some buyers, who are happy to take a monkey for free but aren't actually willing to pay for one, away. Eventually, a market price is established, striking a balance between those willing to sell and those willing to buy. The price tag, then, becomes the allocation mechanism, effectively selecting producers who are willing and able to sell at that price, while also effectively weeding out the buyers who are unwilling or unable to pay. Now, the unwillingness to pay could be a signal that these customers don't value the monkeys as highly, but remember also that it could be a question of income or ability to pay. In a free market, demand and supply reign supreme in determining who produces the products and who receives the products. One obvious drawback to a free market system is that the rich end up with a lion's share of the products and services in the economy, whereas the poor end up with very little. Are there any other methods of allocating the scarce sock monkeys that would be more fair to everyone? It might be possible to have a lottery system for the scarce monkeys. During the housing bubble that occurred in Phoenix around 2005 to 2007, some new neighborhoods that were under development distributed the available lots via lottery rather than opening up a bidding war. Or 
consider the limited number of seats available in some academically elite public or charter schools around the country where students are enrolled by luck of the draw. See the 2010 documentary, Waiting for Superman. The downside to a lottery system, of course, is that you'll still end up with just a few happy people and many more who are dissatisfied and resentful. It merely removes the financial status as a determinant of who's likely to end up with the scarce commodity. Is there an allocation mechanism that would do away with the end result of haves and have-nots inherent in either a free market system or some kind of lottery system? That is to say, how can we ensure that the scarce commodity is distributed equitably so that no one has more than anyone else? In a centrally planned or command economy, the government becomes the allocation mechanism, determining who produces and how much is produced, as well as who receives the good and how much is received. In such a system, assuming the government's motivation is equitable distribution, the government owns the means of production and the scarce output is distributed equally among the citizens. Remember, though, that in our sock monkey example, the original problem was that there were not enough monkeys to satisfy everyone, which is still the case. So how can they be distributed equitably? The government can give each person a fraction of the scarce commodity, with everyone getting an equal share. The downside with this allocation mechanism is that, while no one can say that their share isn't fair and equitable, no individual is entirely satisfied. If, say, there were a hundred sock monkeys, but a thousand people wanted a sock monkey, how would the allocation differ between the market mechanism and the centrally planned economy? In a free market system, the 100 people who are willing to pay the price to get a sock monkey, quite likely those with more money, will get one, while the other 900 will go without. In a centrally planned economy, the 100 sock monkeys would be distributed equally among the 1,000 people, so that each person gets one-tenth of a sock monkey. Everyone gets an equal share, but no individual is fully satisfied. Objectively speaking, it's not our job to say which outcome is better, that's the normative question, but rather to look at the pros and cons of each. The market system fully satisfies some of the people, while others go without, while the centrally planned system gives everyone an equal share, which fully satisfies no one. Of course, as is the case with so many concepts in economics, there is a middle ground continuum of economic systems. In a mixed economy, there is government control and ownership of some key areas. Closer to the centrally planned end of the spectrum, there are economies where the government controls the most important industries such as energy and telecommunication. Closer to the free market end of the spectrum, the government takes ownership of areas that would probably otherwise be underproduced or not produced at all. See micro episode number 33, Public Goods, like education or the postal service. You would be hard pressed to find a purely centrally planned system and likewise for a purely free market system. If you're interested, the Heritage Foundation publishes its Index of Economic Freedom for countries around the world at http heritage.org slash index. Next time, still taking requests. Okay, tell me what your thoughts are in this video in terms of thinking about this video and what did you learn from it? Um, this is just a self reflection. So there's no need to put this as a homework assignment, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so this is just an activity that you may want to consider trying on your own leisure. And section four, this is just some constant checks that the video will go over and this concept um, will be addressed. So thinking about the big picture in terms of macroeconomics, here's a little video. And it's also on YouTube. So all you got to do is just click the right click and copy the video URL. Edward Heath, former prime minister of the United Kingdom once said, Unemployment is of vital importance, particularly to the unemployed. It may seem that most people like to complain about work, but most do see having a job as a much better situation than the alternative, being unemployed. Unemployment doesn't just harm the people who are out of work. 
Economists warn that it is also harmful to society overall because it represents unused resources. The people who cannot find jobs represent goods and services that are not being produced. To some people, an unemployed person is someone who doesn't have a job, but actually, it's more complicated than this. Each month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, polls people who are at least 16 years old about their employment status during that month. The BLS uses the respondents' answers to divide people into three categories employed, someone who currently has a job, out of the labor force, someone who doesn't have a job right now but is not actively looking for a job, or unemployed. Someone who does not have a job right now and is actively looking for a job. To be more exact, the BLS classifies persons as unemployed if they are 16 years or older, do not have a job, have actively looked for work in the previous four weeks, and are currently available to work. Here is an example Chris lost his job due to the recession. He spends his mornings searching online for job openings and his afternoons filling out job applications. Because Chris does not have a job and is actively looking for one, he is considered unemployed. On the other hand, Mark stays home to care for his children. Even though Mark does not have a job, he is not unemployed because he is not actively looking for work. Instead, he is considered to be out of the labor force. Chris is a clear-cut example of someone who is unemployed. And Mark is an equally clear example of someone who is out of the labor force. However, some people's official employment status doesn't tell the whole story. Sometimes it's complicated. Consider the following examples. Josh is a recent graduate looking for a job as an accountant. But he is currently working at Burger Bin to pay the bills until he finds the right job. Even though Josh is actively looking for work, he is not counted as unemployed because he has a job. He is counted as employed. In fact, Josh is considered underemployed which includes workers who are working part-time but would like to work full-time or those working in jobs for which they are overqualified. Mako has been unemployed for six months. She has given up looking for work until she hears the economy may be turning around. Because Mako is not actively looking for a job, she is considered to be out of the labor force. In fact, because she has given up looking for work, Mako is considered a discouraged worker. You can see that while both Josh and Mako are not happy with their employment situations, neither is counted as unemployed. So calculating the unemployment rate is fairly complicated. After categorizing people into groups based on employment status, the BLS determines the unemployment rate, or the percentage of the nation's labor force that is unemployed. The unemployment rate, considered one of the most important indicators of the health of the economy, is calculated by simply dividing the number of people who are unemployed by the number of people who are in the labor force and then multiplying by 100 to turn the decimal into a percentage. The annual unemployment rate changes over time as the economy goes through its cycles. The rate has been as high as 25% in 1933 during the Great Depression and as low as 2.5% in 1953. You can find the current unemployment rate at the BLS website bls.gov, and also at fred.stlouisfed.org. Economists also divide unemployment into three categories. Let's watch Morgan experience all three types of unemployment. The first type of unemployment is frictional unemployment, which occurs when people take time to find a job. It is the short-term unemployment associated with the process of matching workers with jobs. This might be due to workers quitting one job to find another that is a better fit for their skills or lifestyle. Or perhaps students who have just graduated from college and are looking for their first job. Frictional unemployment always exists because there are always some workers in transition. If you are 16 or older, you would be considered frictionally unemployed this summer when you start looking for a summer job. Morgan experienced frictional unemployment when she finished school and spent three weeks looking for a job driving a truck. The second type of unemployment is cyclical unemployment, which is the type that rises during economic downturns and then falls when the economy improves. It is the extra unemployment that occurs during recessions. 
During a recession, firms can't sell as many goods and services as they had expected. As a result, they must reduce their workforce. Morgan lost her job as a truck driver when the economy went into recession. People bought fewer goods, so the demand for shipping services and therefore truck drivers went down. As the economy grows and adds jobs, cyclical unemployment is reduced. However, not everyone who loses a job during a recession finds the same type of job after the recession. In this case, cyclical unemployment can turn into structural unemployment. Structural unemployment, the third type of unemployment, occurs because of a geographic or skill mismatch between workers and employers. This means workers must either learn new job skills, or they must move to a location where jobs that require their skills are more plentiful. This might require an unemployed construction worker to retrain as a computer technician, or an unemployed auto worker in Michigan to move to Tennessee. As the economy changes over time, some industries fade while others are born and grow rapidly, which means workers need different skills. Think of the entire internet economy that didn't exist until the internet went public in the early 1990s. Now millions of people work in the internet economy. These structural changes in available employment mean that workers must be willing to acquire new knowledge and skills. After looking for work as a truck driver for several months, Morgan realized that she was structurally unemployed and has decided to retrain as a web designer, a job with a promising future. The unemployment rate is one of the most important pieces of economic data that economists study. Now that you know the ins and outs of unemployment, you might appreciate this bit of wisdom. The study of economics won't necessarily keep you out of the unemployment line, but at least if you're there, you'll understand why. So here's the question from the video. Now that you know how the unemployment number in the United States is computed, try explaining this concept to another student in class, a friend or a family member, and see how it goes. See how it goes. You don't have to report back, but just see how it goes and, and email me or send me a Canvas message and, and let me know how it went, okay? So here are some constant check. What are the two kinds of monetary policy? What's the fiscal policy? And what problems can a large national debt present for the country? Here's a good chart about the revenues and expenses of the federal budget, right? Here's an application of macroeconomic policy and, and the Fed and how it relates to business and banking. And here are some two videos that you could click and watch. I'm the CEO of Higher Purpose Co. We work with black residents across Mississippi to build community wealth. When I was growing up here in Clarksdale, you know, I didn't realize that we were poor. I didn't realize that we were living in poverty because all of my needs were met. It was early on in college, probably around 2005, where I really started to understand what was happening in the history of the Delta, particularly from an economic perspective. And a lot hasn't necessarily changed. Poverty levels here in Clarksdale and across the Delta are still very high. And being a part of the St. Louis Fed, CDAC, gives me a huge perspective on what's happening across the region. So bringing just a diverse group of people from all over the region into one room to not just talk about problems, but also discuss solutions. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've seen from the St. Louis Fed is that they're listening, they're paying attention, and they're also being proactive by creating solutions to address some of the most challenging problems that we face here in our region, but also throughout the country. Let's listen to this YouTube video from 
Robert Martinez. I'm the owner and operator of Rancho Martinez. We are in the livestock production business. My journey started here in 1980 when um, we moved from Chicago. And I was advised by some people that I knew, they told me, Robert, you need to go back to Chicago. You will never make it here. But we decided to tough it out, and we were uh, surprised by the, uh, 1987. We were uh, selected as your County Farm Family of the Year. And of course, it was not the size or the magnitude of the farm, but I think they appreciate the effort that we were trying to make. The biggest misconception of the Fed, in my opinion, is um, uh, really not knowing what is the mission, what is the purpose of the Federal Reserve Bank. I hear uh, sometimes people come as well, the Federal Reserve Bank is uh, there to protect the interests of the rich people. The Federal Reserve Bank is run by uh, rich white men, and that's not the true. In our board meetings, I can see the diversity of people, every gender, every uh, ethnicity is represented at the Federal Reserve Bank and they are, in my opinion, their eyes and ears, so they have information from every corner of the United States and they are doing the best they can to control uh, the economy. Okay. So, in your self-reflection, Think about the role of the Federal Reserve and how it achieves the macro. Remember, macro means the bigger picture of economic goals. And what do you think of the views of Lampkin and Marti Martinez? What are your thoughts? And what does fiscal policy in government address, right? And how does that help with the deduction of a business in terms of expenses from a tax burden? And what are some ethical considerations that an accountant should take into account when discussing a home business with clients? That's something that you may wanna consider if you are planning to start a home business. What are some of the, the tax exemptions that you can do and tax deductions? Because remember the goal as any business owner is to pay less taxes, but using the IRS tax codes legally to deduct expenses. There are some constant check related to price and demand. What is the relationship between price and demand? Remember, the higher demand of a product or service, the higher the price is. The lower the demand of any product means there's lower the prices because if there's so much, if there's so much supply and less demand, then there's less price, price decreases. If there's increased demand but not a lot of supply then the price increase. Think about your iPhone. iPhones are such a hot item and popular among consumers. There's a high demand for iPhones and smartphones. And when there's less supply, people will pay a premium. If you remember before the pandemic, um, 2018 and 2019, whenever there's a new iPhone coming out, usually around October, November, uh, you could see the lines at Verizon's and phone stores line up to get their newest iPhone model that came out that particular day. And people will spend $1,000 up front just to get that new product. Why is that? There's a demand for it and a desire for it, but why do you think that is? Do we really need an iPhone, right? Uh, do you think it's necessary for the iPhone, right? It also has the features and functions that people demand. And what is market equilibrium achieved? How is it achieved? And describe some of the circumstances under which prices for gasoline would have returned to equilibrium, right? These are just some questions to think about during this lesson and let's get started. So this is an exhibit of demand curve for snowboarders, right? Price increase when there's less quantity of supply of snowboarding, right? When there's a lot of supply, 
and less demand, then the price decreases. Okay. Here's another chart to take a look at. Equilibrium means the balance, the point of which it, it breaks even, okay? Between supply and demand, this little midpoint. And you could also see the shifts when there's decrease in demand and increase in demand. And here are some factors that cause demand and supply curves to shift. This is a great table to review in your textbook on OpenStax. Here's another great table that you might want to use when it talks about the market structures of perfect competition, pure monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly. Here's a, here's a good video that you may want to take a look at. Um, it's based on a film scene. I hope this shows you a good visual of how the law of supply and demand work. And here are just a few questions to think about based on that uh, YouTube video. And this section number seven, we're gonna talk about the market structure. 
There are some questions to think about in the concept check. And here's a good video that kind of describes market structure. Now, cost curves are always going to look the same, but other elements like price, revenue, and demand will differ depending on the market structure that the business operates in. Are there lots of producers or only a few? Is my product just like everyone else's or is it unique? The characteristics of a market will clue you in as to the type of market structure you're dealing with. Really, there's a continuum of market structures. Let's take a look. At one extreme, we have perfect competition. Well, if it's competitive, how many producers are we talking about? A lot. How many is a lot or a large number? Economists aren't really specific about this, but a large number of producers means that there are so many competitors that each one is too small to affect the market. In my mind, I tend to think of maybe a hundred or more so that each competitor has 1% or less of the market. Since nothing you do affects the market, no one really cares what you do and you're free to make decisions without worrying about how the competition will react. How else can I recognize a perfectly competitive market? Besides having a large number of sellers, each of those sellers will be producing exactly the same thing. In perfect competition, the product is identical or homogeneous or non-differentiated, no matter who produces it. One more characteristic, it's easy for firms to come and go from the industry. That is, there's free entry and exit. Think about it. This industry has lots of producers. Why? Because it's easy to get in and set up shop. In an industry like this, lots of producers all producing exactly the same thing, how much market power where market power is defined as the ability to control the price, does an individual firm have? None. You have no ability to drive the price because one, you're so small, and two, everyone else produces exactly what you do. Time to think. What would happen if you tried to raise your price? Now let's take a look at the opposite extreme of the market structure spectrum. Instead of a huge number of producers, there's only one producer for the whole market, or a monopoly, the prefix mono meaning one. Furthermore, the monopolist's product is unique. There really are no substitutes for this product. Lastly, in a monopolistic industry, entry by other firms is nearly impossible due to the extremely high barriers to entry. We'll get into this more later, but a barrier to entry could be really high costs or legal protection like patents or copyrights. Given all of these characteristics, only one producer, a unique product, and no one else can get into the industry to compete with you, how much market power, ability to control price, does the monopoly producer have? The monopolist has complete control over the price within the boundaries of what consumers are willing to pay. Are there other structures? Sure. In fact, most real world industries will fall somewhere in the middle ground, not at the theoretical extremes of perfect competition or monopoly. Two of these mid-range structures are monopolistic competition and oligopoly. A monopolistically competitive structure is still competitive, so there's still a lot of producers. Given that there are lots of producers, we can assume that entry into the industry is easy. Unlike perfect competition, however, the products are not exactly the same. Highly similar, yes. Highly substitutable, yes, but not identical. Think about, oh, toothbrushes. You go to the store and there are toothbrushes with square heads, diamond heads, rubber grip handles, bi-level bristles, toothbrushes that play music, toothbrushes that glow in the dark, even with color indicators that tell you when to buy a new toothbrush. All toothbrushes, all highly similar and highly substitutable, but with slight differences. If I believe, as a consumer, that having a rubber grip handle helps clean my teeth better, then this differentiation gives the producer a small amount of market power he or she could raise the price a little bit and I would still buy that rubber grip handle toothbrush. If they raise the price too much though, I'll switch to some other type of toothbrush. An oligopoly? Well, the prefix oli means few, so I'll have a few large producers making up the market, each with a large amount of control or market power. There are some barriers to entry, so it's hard, but not impossible, to get in. The product in an oligopolistic market can be identical, like the members of OPEC who produce oil, or differentiated, like car manufacturers. Also, 
the small number of producers could be just a handful like cars or a couple of dozen like the oil producers. The key is that there are few enough producers that each one has a fairly large chunk of the market, large enough that any individual producer can affect what happens in the market. Because everyone's actions matter, the producers become mutually interdependent. Whatever one does affects everyone else. This mutual interdependence actually makes the oligopoly the most complicated type of market structure to operate in. Now that you know something about each market, I have an exercise for you. See if you can come up with real world examples for each type. What kind of product or products would fit the perfectly competitive structure? What about monopolistically competitive? Oligopolistic? What about monopolistic? Have your answers ready because I'll be asking for your responses in our next class. Next time, perfect competition. So this is an activity. Um, this is not necessarily for homework to turn in, but this may give you some idea about the market. So this table, self-reflection and self-activity. Pick a firm, a company, and discuss whether it's a perfect competition, monopolistic, oligopoly, and monopoly. And section eight, we're gonna talk about trends, economic trends. These are the three concept checks that you might wanna take a look at. And we are done. Now let's go back real quick. If you click on this table right here, table one, three, it'll open up in your textbook and you should be able to see this table. And this textbook will also show you more details of these concepts. Okay. Thank you for your time. And let me show you This is the book for chapter one, if you click on each of these items, you'll be able to see the material. Okay. Please review the textbook, review the PowerPoint slides, and let me know what I could do to assist you during this week. And next week we will review chapter two.